once again, if you have any prayer requests, I see uh, I've gotten a couple of emails or I've seen some emails kind of coming um, across. Uh, so uh, if you have anything in particular that uh, you'd like included on the prayer list, uh, please uh, give me a quick note uh, and I'll, I'll get them all compiled. Uh, and as always, you know, continue to pray for all of the churches around the world um, where the gospel is preached. So we definitely want to keep them in prayer as well as our pastors as they prepare their viewers for this upcoming week. Uh, I was just mentioning to Pastor Tim, uh, some of you may, may or may not know this gentleman, but uh, please pray for the Hamilton family, um, which is Ron Hamilton. Um, some of you may or may not know him as Pastor Pyre um, from many, 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 many years ago. Um, so he is now near, uh, near going on. Uh, he's been battling dementia for quite some time, um, but now it looks like he is, could be quite literally hours from, from passing. So uh, definitely be in prayer for the Hamilton family. You know, here's a man that has been used by God in his old character of past fire to reach countless of children, um, kind of growing up and understanding some of the basic tenets of the faith. Uh, and it's bittersweet. Um, with all the memories attached to him, but joyous that he is going to soon be embracing the Savior. As his wife posted on online, uh, he'll be seeing him with both eyes, so both of his eyes. But pray for the Hamilton family. Uh, let's go to our Lord in prayer, and just like Sunday, we'll be singing a uh, hymn tonight, uh, He Will Hold Me Fast, so we'll be singing that here in just a moment. Let's pray. Father, we thank you again for this honor and privilege to gather as a body of believers in your house. And Father, even as we contemplate where your gospel is preached, we know that many brothers and sisters around the world do not have this privilege and do not have this, this, uh, this flexibility and ease. We do ask first and foremost, Lord, that you would always, wherever your word is preached, Lord, that you would give the men and the women strength to preach and the boldness to do so and the faith to continue under trials and tribulations. And Father, here in this country, Lord, we ask that you would not allow us to be complacent, but Lord, rejoice in the freedoms that we have, but also, at the same time, take full advantage that, that we can go out to the highways and byways, as it were, to preach your gospel to our co-workers, Lord, to our friends, to our loved ones. Father, forgive us when too many times we put excuses to do so. Father, we, we know that we often pray that you would give us opportunities. Father, every second of every day that you allow us to walk past somebody is an opportunity. We ask that you remove the excuses that we have in our hearts and our minds and the fear that grips us. But just be bold and to preach your word and to proclaim it. Father, tonight we ask that you would also be with the Hamilton family in South Carolina. Lord, as mentioned, Lord, it's bittersweet to see our brother uh, nearing your very presence. Father, bitter because of his family that he will leave behind, the pain that no doubt will come and the sorrow. But Father, ever so sweet that yet another soul is going to meet his, his King and his Redeemer. Father, we pray for the comfort of the Holy Spirit to be upon the family. And Father, that even in this, Lord, that souls would continue to come to a saving knowledge of Christ. Father, we ask this and that you would be with our pastor tonight. In Christ's name. Amen. Amen. So if you do take your hymns of grace and turn to the one number 388. 388. And if you'll stand there, we'll sing the first two hymns of the third will be uh, a cappella and so sung. <laughs> Thank you. 
This was a time when the great Pelagian heresy was reintroduced by men like Finney, uh, who insisted that man had, by virtue of his free will, the ability to choose to accept the Lord Jesus Christ or to reject him. In other words, it was not God who determined the fate of every man, it was man himself. God gave every man, according to Pelagius, God gave every man the ability uh, to choose whether to be saved or not to be saved, and God was duty bound to respect that choice. Again, very, very damaging uh, in terms of its impact on local churches. Uh, many of the churches of the Second Great Awakening period uh, abandoned the scriptures as the lone source of truth, opting instead for wholesale pragmatism, emotional manipulation as the preferred uh, method for building churches. In addition to these erroneous ideas and teachings, and no doubt at least uh, in part as a result of them, it was also around this time that a sub-movement came into being. This sub-movement was known as the Second Advent Awakening. And it was during this time that it really began to pick up steam. It actually began slightly before the Second Great Awakening, but it came into prominence during the Second Great Awakening. During uh, the years before the Second Great Awakening, um, sometime around 1816, there was a Baptist minister from Lowhampton, New York, named William Miller. Uh, William Miller, uh, not unlike his contemporaries in Europe and England at the time, William Miller had become fascinated, almost preoccupied, with the second coming of Christ. There was great fervor uh, in England and all over Europe about the second advent of Christ because certain key figures in Europe and England began toying with this passage found in Daniel, which spoke of the 2300 days, uh, which is roughly six and one-third years, the 2300 days evenings and mornings, referenced in Daniel 8, 14. Uh, it was believed that this prophecy uh, would mark the beginning of the end, at the end of this 2300 uh, evenings and mornings, this prophecy would bring about the second coming of Christ. And you might be saying, well, wait a minute, it was much longer than 2300 days uh, when Jesus ascended into heaven and the 19th century, and you'd be correct there. But Archbishop Usher had actually taught that this 2,300 days was not 2,300 days at all, but 2,300 years. Uh, it's not unlike the introduction of dispensational thought, where people like C.I. Schofield and Clarence Larkin decided to take it upon themselves to just make things up out of whole cloth based upon their own allegorical and otherwise faulty interpretations of the scriptures. And so, you know, people believe what Archbishop Usher had to say, and they said, well, if it's 2,300 years and not 2,300 days, then we can accurately calculate when the Lord will return. Again, it's what happens when you leave people to their own devices, when you leave people uh, with flights of fancy. And bear in mind, 1816, uh, this is at the beginning of what we have termed uh, the modern period. Uh, the pre-modern era is gone. The modern period is being thrust in our faces, and now we have technology. It has the answer to all of our questions, and we've got rampant uh, renaissance going on all over the world. Uh, science is king, and so on and so forth, and so that people didn't feel left behind, many theologians jumped on the bandwagon and started finding newfangled ways to understand the scriptures. And this is one of them. So this William Miller took this teaching from Archbishop Usher and ran with it. Now, what are we to make, actually, in these 2,300 days? Well, if you're at all familiar with uh, the history of the world during this particular time, especially religious history, uh, most credible scholars believe that this 
particular prophecy was fulfilled during the reign of Antiochus IV, or Antiochus Epiphanes, if you will. Uh, Antiochus desecrated the temple in Jerusalem. Uh, he severely persecuted the Jews from around 170 B.C. to about 164 B.C., this is that six-year period, the, the 2300 days. And when he died, the Jews purified and rededicated the temple, uh, just as Daniel predicted. And so most conservative, credible scholars, uh, I believe, are correct in assuming that this is a reference to that particular uh, thing that actually took place, um, not some obscure reference to 2,300 years that have yet to transpire. In fact, it was this purification and restoration of the temple after the brutal reign of Antiochus Epiphanes. Uh, this is the reason that Jews today celebrate Hanukkah. And so, again, it's widely accepted that this was the 2,300 days that Daniel spoke of. So that's pretty clear, right? Well, not so fast. Not if you're William Miller. Not if you're uh, wanting it to mean something else and you're trying to uh, force Scripture into your own theological presuppositions. Remember what we've said about presuppositionalism. The Scriptures form our presuppositions. We don't take our presuppositions into the Scriptures and make the Scriptures mean what we want them to say based on those presuppositions. We draw our presuppositions from the Word of God itself. One is called exegesis, that is going through the Scriptures and drawing out the meaning of the text as it was to be understood by the author who wrote it, to whom he wrote it, when he wrote it, right? The other is eisegesis, where we take our preconceived ideas and we hoist them over onto the Scriptures. And that's exactly what people like William Miller uh, had done. Based on their calculations, that is, William Miller and others who jumped on the bandwagon, based on their calculations, uh, many, both ministers and Bible students, began insisting that Christ would return in 1843. As soon as they began saying that Christ would return in 1843, not to be outdone, uh, William Miller came up with the exact date of October 22nd, 1844, for Christ's return. And it was this pronouncement that created all the fervor surrounding what we now refer to as the Second Advent Movement. And just for the record, let me say that we're still living in the midst of the Second Advent Movement. Uh, I don't know if you've noticed or not, you should have noticed, but there's an undue fascination uh, it seems, with all things relating to the second coming of Christ. Book after book after book has been written in an effort to ascertain when the Lord is coming back, even though the Son of Man didn't even know. The Son of Man in the kenosis, that is his willing, uh, willingly setting aside his prerogative to know as God of very God, even the Son of Man, when asked, when will you come back? I don't know. Nobody knows. We ought to be content with that, right? But again, people being who they are, they're not content with that. They want to be able to pinpoint the exact date. Some of you remember, uh, some of you were alive during the late 70s, early 80s. Remember a book called The Late Great Planet Earth? Remember that? That was how Lindsay's attempt to point everybody's attention to the Battle of Armageddon and how we were getting closer and closer and closer. We wouldn't even make it through the 80s before the Lord returned. Now, he didn't come out with an exact date, which was pretty clever of him, but he did insist that we're living in the last times, in the 80s. Well, then the 80s came in, and he wrote another book called The 1990s, Countdown to Armageddon. Right? And so we weren't even supposed to make it out of the 90s. But we did. And then you've got clowns, uh, pastors like, like John Hayden, who come out of the woodwork. Folks, let me just say, I don't know how many blood moons we've had since his writing the book, The Four Blood Moons, but it's been a lot. 
And yet, here we are. And Jesus has not arrived on the scene. You know, these men ought to be grateful that they don't live in the old time. Because they would have been so. They're false prophets. And yet, there's this undue fascination with all things second coming. Now, don't get me wrong. There is nothing at all wrong. In fact, there's everything right about anticipating and longing for the second coming of Christ. Nobody would dispute that. We long to see the Lord return. As a result, we are on the alert. We're ready at any moment for the Lord's return. Whenever He decides to do that. But what's not healthy is being so preoccupied with what's going to happen tomorrow or the next day that you lose sight of today. As believers, we need to focus far more on on the Lord's working through us, in us, and to us today, this day, as opposed to worrying about tomorrow. Didn't Jesus say that? Yes. Don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow will bring a whole new set of problems of its own. Worry about today. Well, actually, don't worry at all. But be focused on today. James tells us that too. Don't say tomorrow that we'll go here and do such and such. You don't even know that you'll be alive tomorrow. Worry about today. But again, there's no doubt that we live in a time where there's great fascination. I remember during the First and Second Gulf Wars, there was a sudden resurgence then uh, of books being written by those who seemed to be able to think of a little else than pinpointing the date of Christ's return. Now, before you're tempted to come down too hard on Miller, and we sometimes do this, let me just caution you against that, because Miller's the byproduct of his times. Miller himself is caught up in all kinds of societal pressures, all kinds of, of things that we can't relate to, because we're not living during those times. And so, let me just give you something here. Walter Martin uh, noted this, uh, about the time period that Miller uh, was living in. He said, the great Advent awakening which spanned the Atlantic from Europe was bolstered by a tremendous wave of contemporary biblical scholarship. And though Miller himself was uneducated, there were literally scores and scores of interpretive prophetic scholars, both in Europe and the United States, who espoused Miller's view before he himself announced it. And in reality, his was only one more voice proclaimed to the 1843-1844 fulfillment of Daniel 8. 14 or the 2300 days period. So even Martin acknowledges Miller was just caught up in the fervor. He was caught up in the excitement. And if there is consensus, it's not unlike the climate change hysteria that we see going on around us at any given moment. I fear it's gotten out of control now because, I mean, really impactful decisions are being made the world over in the name of a hoax. And if you, I'm not one of these climate deniers, folks. I mean, I, I think we ought to be good stewards of what God has given us in creation. I think we ought to be uh, conservationists when it comes to um, protecting what the Lord has so graciously given us in all the things around us. But how cavalier must we be to insist that we have the power to undo what God has not only created, but what He Himself sustains every day? We can't do it. We can't do it. And yet the hysteria is real, isn't it? And many people are caught up in it who would otherwise be sound thinkers. It's a cult. It's a cult, it's a cult of its own. Absolutely. Now, that being said about Miller and him being caught up in all of these things, he did become the leader of those who would begin calling themselves Millerites. Let me just say something else about Miller before I continue. Miller was not a cult leader. He just wasn't. Cult leaders have motives predicated on self-interest, self-aggrandizement. They generally promote error, knowing they're promoting error, to their own ends. Miller wasn't a cult leader. By all accounts, he was highly respected. 
He was very well loved. He was considered, even by those who vehemently disagreed with his conclusions, he was considered to be a deeply religious, honest, and forthright Christian man and pastor. Now, initially, Miller had set the date of Christ's return to somewhere between March 21st, 1843 and March 21st, 1844. But guess what? The latter day came, March 21st, 1844, and Miller was forced to change his prediction to October 22nd, 1844. Remember Harold Camping? Um, Harold Camping, it hasn't been that long ago. Uh, that he passed on, but Harold Camping uh, was also one in our modern day who predicted the second coming of Christ multiple times without fail. And what did he do every time he failed? He would recalculate. You know, he was so convinced that he was right, he would just back up and recalculate every time he was wrong. Well, Miller uh, was wrong about this, and then October 22nd came and went. Uh, and this gave rise to another movement known as the seventh month movement. And you're probably thinking, wait a minute, October's not the seventh month, that's the tenth month. What gives? Well, according to the Jewish calendar, October is the seventh month. And so he was using the Jewish calendar, not the Gregorian calendar. And so it became known as the seventh month movement. But long story short, October 1844 came and went, and Jesus had returned. What happened to the Millerite movement? It disintegrated. That's what it should. It disintegrated, and this became known as the Great Disappointment. It's actually it's a, an actual period of time in history known as the Great Disappointment of 1844. As for Miller, Walter Martin has written, he died shortly thereafter. A broken and disillusioned man who was nevertheless honest and forthright when in error or when repudiated error. And there could be no honest doubt that he now enjoys the presence of the Lord whose parents he so anxiously awaited. And let me just add to this. Aren't you glad that there's no doctrinal test at the end of it all? Aren't you glad that God is gracious enough to save you even though you might be miserably wrong? I, I hate to break with some of you folks. I mean, we know in this church we have any number of eschatological positions. This church does not have an official eschatological position. I've told you before, I, I waffle all the time between Historic pre mill and on mill, depending on you know how how firm some people are in their resolve, you might convince me to even feel like a post mill for now and again. But here's the thing: one of us is wrong, right? One of us has errors in the way we think about such things. Now think about that and multiply that times all the possible combinations of doctrines that we all hold dear. One of us is wrong more than once. How wrong can you be before you have to forfeit your salvation? Well, we have safeguards for that, don't we? There are certain core tenets of the faith that we must believe. The virgin birth, the deity of Christ, the triune nature of God, the fact that there is going to be a second coming. The fact that Jesus is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. There's plenty of things that we have to agree on because they're fundamentally true in the Scripture. All of these other things, though, that we're uncertain about, not only is there not going to be a test, but you can be horribly wrong and still be considered a believer. I've used the example before. I'll use it again. How much theology do you think the man on the, the thief on the cross had? He had not a Zip. Zilch. In fact, only hours before the Lord said, today you'll be with me in paradise, he's talking as much smack about the Lord as the other guy. 
And yet, by the grace of God, he was redeemed. Now, I'm not saying doctrine is unimportant. Doctrine is crucially important. If you've been here for any length of time, you know that. But we need to get away from this idea that people who are wrong or people who disagree with us can't be said. That's evil. And it's uncalled In Miller's case, I believe Martin is right. This Savior that Miller longed so much to see, if he put a date on it, I believe Miller is even now, by all accounts, basking in the radiance of the city. Millerite movement, though, did die. And so the question remains, what does William Miller have to do with Seventh-day Adventists? I mean, if he was a false prophet, which he, he was, only by the grace of God did he escape that, I think. But Miller died, the Millerite movement dies. What does that have to do with Seventh-day Adventism? Is there a connection to be made? Well, as a matter of fact, there is. On the morning after the great disappointment of 1844, one of Miller's followers, a man named Hiram Edson, claimed to have seen a vision of Jesus standing at the altar in heaven. This led him to conclude that Miller had been right about the date, but wrong about the place of Jesus' return. Jesus' return wasn't to the earth, but was actually a move into the heavenly sanctuary referred to in Hebrews 8, 1 and 2. Now, why it took Jesus so long from his ascension until then to move into the heavenly sanctuary, nobody knows. And how convenient is it for this man, Edson, to say, the day after the great disappointment, oh, wait, 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 I just had a vision. Miller was right about the day. He was just wrong about where Jesus was moving. Jesus moved into the heavenly sanctuary. This is one of the hallmarks of Seventh-day Adventist doctrine. They believe in this sanctuary doctrine. That on this particular day, Jesus moved into the sanctuary in heaven. Edson's teaching caught the attention of another former Millerite named Joseph Bates. And it was Joseph Bates who began promoting this idea that Miller had accurately predicted the day that Jesus had moved into the heavenly sanctuary. In other words, this is a bit of historical revisionism. Joseph Bates comes along and he says, it's not that Miller was wrong. He was right about the day. He was also right about this move. We were just too naive to understand it. So he began to be an apologist for Miller. No doubt trying to resurrect the Millerite movement. Right? Once you get a, a prophet, you know, you want that prophet to remain credible as long as you can. He published a pamphlet that turned out to be really influential. And this pamphlet became known to a couple, James and Ellen White. As many of you already know, Ellen G. White is revered as a prophetess by Seventh-day Adventists who routinely read and rely on her expositions of the scriptures to this day. Like Hiram Edson and Joseph Bates, Ellen White claimed that following the Great Disappointment of 1842, she too began receiving visions. In one vision in particular, she said she saw a narrow path where an angel was guiding Adventists. And where was he guiding them? He was guiding them to a group whose formation had resulted from the teaching of Edison Bates and James and Ellen White that would later be crystallized into the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Now, where did this name Seventh-day Adventist come from? Well, they weren't called that until 1860. They set their headquarters up in Battle Creek, Michigan. And they began calling themselves Seventh-day Adventists because they were Adventists, focused, like Miller was, on the second advent of Christ. But they also saw it necessary to return the worship of the church to the seventh day as opposed to the first day. They insisted that worship in the churches be held on Saturday instead of Sunday. 
Now they also brought a whole lot of other strange doctrines, kind of a, a renaissance of thoughts stemming from Leviticus, Deuteronomy. They were very heavy on the law. Seventh day events to this day come in court, uh, and they have a lot of rules and regulations that uh, are rooted in Old Testament uh, law based thinking. We'll talk about that before we go on in our next time together. But the Seventh-day Adventists, before long, began to see themselves as the true church, the remnant church, if you will. They often refer to themselves as the remnant church. And this is typical of many cults. This is one of the things that I believe earmarks them as at least a potential Cult. Now, why do I say that? Why don't I just uh, boldly proclaim they're a cult? Well, you might be surprised to learn that consensus among scholars today, scholars are very reluctant to call them a cult. Why? Do they believe some strange things? Yes. Yes. But you know, as Reformed Baptists, we think our dispensationalist brethren are teaching really strange things. Right? I mean, so there, you know, the, the, the tent containing strange things is really big. Right? Now, I'm going to read some things to you that Walter Martin said. Now, okay, who's Walter Martin? Walter Martin himself is a Reformed Baptist. A lot of people don't know that. Walter Martin is highly respected. Walter Martin is the founder of the Christian Research Institute. Walter Martin wrote the book, uh, what I believe is still the definitive work on the cult. It's called The Kingdom of the Cults. If you don't own a copy of that, you should. It's very instructive, very well written, very thorough. Uh, and so, again, not that there's uh, just so rain is clear on this. I'm not making an appeal to authority. That's a logical fallacy, right? Um, but I do believe that people of Martin's stature uh, should be at least listened to. And his opinion should weigh, to some degree, into the argument. Listen to what he said. And if you disagree with Martin, hey, you do you, right? That's okay. Concerning the claims of Seventh-day Adventists as believers, Martin writes this. He said, the writer writes himself. He's obviously used to writing in academia. He never refers to himself in the first person. For all my seminary students, or wannabe seminary students, do not write in the first person. We don't do that. So Martin says, the writer has read extensively in the publications of the Seventh-day Adventist denomination and almost all the writings of Ellen G. White, including her testimonies, and feels free to state that there could be no doubt that Mrs. White was a born-again Christian woman who truly loved the Lord Jesus Christ and who dedicated herself unstintingly to the task of bearing witness for him as she felt led. It should be clearly understood that in some places Orthodox Christian theology and the interpretations of Mrs. White do not agree. In fact, in some places they are at direct waterheads. But on the cardinal doctrines of the Christian faith necessary to the salvation of the soul and the growth of the life in Christ, Ellen G. White has never written anything which is seriously contrary to the simple, plain declarations of the gospel. One may disagree with Mrs. White's interpretation of the atonement and the scapegoat. One may challenge her stress on the seventh-day Sabbath, health reform, conditional immortality, etc., but no one can fairly challenge your writings on the basis of their conformity to the basic principles of the gospel uh, for conform they most certainly do. I, when I first read that, I was like, wait, whoa, 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 wait. <laughs> you know, but maybe Ellen White was his great-grandmother or something, you know. Maybe he's particularly fond of her. He sure is writing a glowing testimony. Uh, but again, accepted at face value. This is Walter Martin, who is otherwise brutal when it comes to assessing what cults believe and what they practice. And here he's kind of pulling back a little bit. Why? Don't know. Listen to this. Seventh-day Adventism, or at least opponents to Seventh-day Adventism, often 
make claims about Ellen G. White and the Seventh-day Adventists that apparently are true. Imagine that, right? I mean, how many people do you know who, uh, instead of doing the research for themselves, they're very prone to make what's called a priori arguments. They, they simply go out and attack people and things based on what other people have said about them. It's called the bandwagon. Everybody likes to jump on the bandwagon, right? Uh, Mark doesn't allow that. Instead, he makes his own assessments based upon what information he can gather. And he said this. He said, many critics of Seventh-day Adventism have assumed, again, based on theoretical deduction as opposed to in-depth research of their own, most have assumed, mostly from the writings of professional Adventist detractors, such as E.G. Jones, that Mrs. White was a fearsome ogre who devoured all who opposed her. And they've never, uh, they've never stopped saying that Seventh-day Adventists believe that she is infallible despite the published official position of the denomination, which states the direct contrary to these perversions. To quote the official denominational position, Ellen G. White's writings are not the source of our expositions. We derive our faith from the scriptures and our interpretations of prophecy were all established before Mrs. White spoke or wrote thereon. We hold her writings in high esteem and believe that the Holy Spirit illumined her mind in the penning of these councils to the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Their conformity with biblical, historical, and scientific facts is truly remarkable, we feel, but we do not and never have put them on a, a parity with Scripture as some falsely charge. In addition to this statement, the following comment from the representatives of the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists, which is the governing body and voice of the Seventh-day Adventists worldwide, clearly states the denominational position relative to Ellen G. White. Here it is. Seventh-day Adventists uniformly believe that the canon of Scripture closed with the book of Revelation. We hold that all writings and teachings are to be judged by and are subject to the Bible, which stands alone and unique as the source and norm of our Christian faith. We do not consider Ellen G. White to be in the category of the writers of the canon of Scripture. Her writings are regarded by Adventists as containing special counsel from God concerning personal religion and the conduct of our denominational work. That portion of her writings, which might be classified as prediction, actually forms a very small segment. And even when she deals with what is coming on earth, her statements are only amplifications of biblical prophecy. She did not assume the title of a prophet, but simply a messenger of the Lord. To claim to be a prophetess is something that I have never, is something that I have never done, she says. But my work is that I cannot call myself other than a messenger sent to bear a message from the Lord. While it's true that Seventh Day Adventists told Mrs. White in her writings in Grace, the Bible is their only rule of faith and practice. We, as fellow Christians, may violently disagree with their attitude toward Mrs. White, but nothing she ever wrote on those doctrines essential to salvation or Christian living would characterize her in any way as being other than a Christian in every sense of the term. So again, I don't know about you, but I, I found that somewhat enlightening as opposed to what they actually teach about her. And let's be fair, uh, there's no need to pile on. They have enough problems of their own. We're going to talk about the bad stuff next time. I'm not going to leave uh, this the way it is. I'm not going to let Martin speak uh, and be the sole arbiter of truth here. I want to just read those things so that we have a, a good platform, a good foundation to launch into our next study and begin talking about the real problematic issues within Seventh-day Adventism. Uh, I would encourage you to always do that. Always be quick to give the benefit of the doubt as opposed to the other way around. Because the truth will bear itself out. The truth can be known. The truth will be known. As you explore these things, but don't just jump on the bandwagon with these a priori arguments uh, from others who had an axe to grind with a certain group of people, right? In fact, you know, the, the very same people who recoil against her claim to be a, a prophetess or the fact that she acted in the role of a prophet, uh, many of those same people have no problem with being in the head. Or Kenneth Copeland, or Paul White, or Joyce Meyer, or any of those other heretics that orbit in that pantheon of, of buffoons and nerdy wells, right?
So let's be careful that we don't just jump on the bandwagon. Not surprisingly, the Christian Research Institute, again founded by Walter Martin, um, has actually, they put this on the website, since Seventh-day Adventism does accept the foundational doctrines of historic Christianity, the Trinity, the Christ, the Deity, the Bible, the Resurrection, etc., we do not believe that it should be classified as a non-Christian cult. It's our conviction that one cannot be a true Jehovah's Witness, Mormon, Christian scientist, etc., and be a practicing Christian in the biblical sense of the word. But it is possible to be a Seventh-day Adventist and a true follower of Jesus, despite certain distinctive Adventist doctrines, which we consider to be unbiblical. Now, does this mean that I'm advocating that we find the nearest Seventh-day Adventist church and link arms with them and sing Kumbaya to the cows No. No. Again, this is just a well-informed opinion that I think needs further fleshing out. Nathan Boosnitz, I don't know if you're familiar with Nathan Boosnitz. Nathan Boosnitz uh, is from um, Grace Community Church, John Carter's Church. Uh, very, uh, he's a uh, professor there at the Master's um, College and Seminary. And listen to what he says, because I think I agree with Nathan's assessment more than just taking what Martin says for what he writes. Nathan Boosman says, although few evangelicals today consider uh, the Seventh-day Adventists a non-Christian cult, many still caution against embracing the denomination as an acceptable branch of Protestantism. In spite of the ecumenical spirit that has pervaded evangelicalism over the last few decades, there are still major deficiencies within official SDA theology that ought to give evangelical Christians serious thought. So that's kind of where my assessment stands at this point. What do they believe in particular, though, that should give us serious pause? You'll have to come back next week. <laughs> and we'll talk more in depth about that. Again, like I've done before with the Mormons and the Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, I wanted to lay the groundwork to kind of give us a, a step up in terms of knowing what we can expect. Um, you know, a lot of times when we think of groups that we know nothing about, again, we're, our first instinct is to just demonize them right from the start without really knowing enough about some of the more substantive things. Now we know where they came from, that many people don't consider them a cult. I'm going to leave that up to you after our next show.